Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome, America, to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. It is so great to be back, people. I've been traveling most of the last half of the summer, and we've got some great guests to kick off what's turning into quickly our fall season here. First of all, coming up here in about seven or eight minutes, we're going to be talking to Jane Blasio. She is a writer of a book writing about her own story called Taken at Birth. Yeah, you're going to want to hear this one coming up in just a little bit. Then later in the show, from our sponsors over at Legacy Tree Genealogist, Sarah Gutman is back talking about some new databases from Italy. And this is really fun because who knew that some of these things existed over there? She didn't know. She's found them out. She's going to share with you what you may be able to start finding online either right now or very soon in some cases. So good stuff coming up there. Hey, if you haven't signed up for our weekly Genie newsletter yet, we would love to have you on board for that. Just go to our website, ExtremeGenes.com, to do it or on our Facebook page. Right now, it's time to head out to Boston, Massachusetts, where David Allen Lambert is standing by. He's been doing a little traveling himself lately. He's with the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, that chief genealogist. David, how the heck you doing? I'm doing great, but I'll tell you, I didn't have to worry about packing and washing laundry between my two trips because my first one was in Orlando, Florida to Disney with my family. And then less than 10 days later, I was on a cruise ship lecturing for genealogy cruises in Alaska. So the shorts and T-shirts were not necessary in Alaska. No, they certainly are. It's a little chilly up there, <laughs> even in August. I've done that trip. That's that's a great mm-hmm. time. Yeah, I did three trips myself, went back to the East Coast and visited my childhood home that my parents built uh, in 1958 that we lived in for 20 years. Boy, has that mm-hmm. changed a little bit. A little, oh. a little strange. And uh, went to a revolutionary cemetery where eight of my directs are buried in East Chester, New York. Kind of this little... 18th century island in the middle of all this urban sprawl that is now Mount wow. Vernon, New York. That was fun. Mm-hmm. Saw a lot of family mm-hmm. members, old friends, had our 50th high school reunion. It was great. Wow. And then went to the West Coast where my son got married. So congrats to Eric and his lovely bride, Corinne, on uh, a wonderful day a week and a half ago. So that, that was really thrilling. But it's so good to be back. And uh, we've got stories today. we got great guests. So let's get started with our family histoire news. Well, first, we have to have a moment of remembrance of Queen Elizabeth II, yes. monarch for 70 years. No doubt the distant cousin of many of our listeners. <laughs> if you have any early English ancestry, you may have a royal line. King Charles III, we haven't had a King Charles since the 17th century. That's right. And it didn't go so well with those early King Charleses, I should mention. Mm, no. So I hope he doesn't lose <laughs> uh, his head over being the king. Right. Um, well, all the stories I have for you are very macabre, but, you know, a guy that writes cemetery books, it makes sense, right? Yes, of course. So the remains of 17 individuals were found in 2004 at the bottom of a well. This well was 800 years old, so it wasn't like a modern crime scene. This was in Norwich, England. Okay. So there were 11 children and six adults, but now they've determined from DNA that they have Jewish heritage. Huh. And it's most likely fish that they were killed during rioting in the year 1190 during the Third Crusade. Wow. So this was a, an anti-Semitic period of time in that area. Mm-hmm. And so they found right. 17 people in an old well that's over 800 years old. Crazy. If it wasn't for DNA, they'd probably still be wondering who they were. Yeah. Well, you know, I love ice cream as much as the next person. And sometimes it can give you a little bit of a bellyache, but in the 19th century, it could kill you. That is a great story on JSTOR about ice cream basically killing you because of the way it was served and what was in it. Like bowls not being washed out, but just being wiped clean and then given to the next customer. Talk (laughs) about bacteria. Yeah. You can find all sorts of things in the ice cream, including the ingredients. Yeah. And they're saying that the reason the dairy products were changed so much to make them healthier and safer was because of all this danger from ice cream leading up to the 1880s. 
Well, I'm glad they got rid of vanillin poisoning, which yeah. is actually a term <laughs> that you probably never heard of, folks, but your great grandparents may have heard of it. Absolutely. Oh, now we have yet another veteran who died in 1941 on the Oklahoma, and he's finally laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery. Yeah. And this sailor's name is Herbert Jacobson. He was another Oklahoma boy, buried as unknown, but DNA, yet again, has helped out this Isn't mystery. Great. He was 21 years old, and if he were around today, he'd be 101. Yeah, my friend Horace, he's 98, and he was 17 at Pearl Harbor, and he's on social media and sharp as a tech. Nice. He calls himself Old Salt. <laughs> uh, in Sanford, Maine, a few years back, they were putting in a new Cumberland Farms, and they found a casket. Well, recently they found another casket. And what they've determined is, and this happens so many times around the world, they moved the cemetery. Well, not that well, apparently. And the Woodlawn Cemetery in Sanford, Maine, was moved by the 1930s, except for at least these two. And how many more? We don't know yet. Wow. And there was a little girl in it, I understand. But the coffin it itself is pretty much deteriorated. But what an amazing find. Imagine digging a hole to put in a restaurant and finding these things in there. It makes for quite a story, doesn't it? It does. And with DNA, who knows? Right. How about a shipwreck in a river in Germany, nearly 400 years old, that had over 80 barrels of a substance called quicklime? And it's still intact. <laughs> the wow. thing about this is you think about pollution in rivers and whatnot. Well, this river was polluted with a shipwreck. 36 feet into the water, the barrels are still intact. And quicklime, incidentally, if you don't know, was used in the production of metals, also in paper. It was used for a variety of different treatments of iron and steel and pulp production. Well, that's all I have from Beantown. But remember, if you're not a member of American Ancestors, we've been waiting 177 years for you to join. <laughs> Use the coupon code EXTREME and save $20 on AmericanAncestors.org. All right, David. Thank you so much. We will talk to you again at the back end of the show as we do Ask Us Anything. All right. And coming up next, we're going to talk to a woman who has written her story, Taken at Birth. You've got to hear what Jane Blasio has to say about this. Coming up next when we return in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked? and need to find details before you go. Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogist. Legacy Tree Genealogist has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogists calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Genies, 10 years ago, in April of 2012, when the government released the 1940 census, it took Ancestry several months to complete and review an accurate index. Fast forward to today, using proprietary handwriting reading software, it took Ancestry only nine days to get the job done with the 1950 census. Now they held back results for a time for actual humans to review what the software had created. And after just a few weeks, it became obvious the software was near perfect and the computer generated index to 153,000 names has been released. What does this mean in your journey to research your family? It means you can search the entire database quickly and easily for your family members. Never has a U.S. Census Index been created as quickly as this. Go to Ancestry.com today. Click on the 1950 Census on the homepage and see what you can discover. Hey Genies, it's Fisher here, and my shiny new ExtremeGenes.com website has been described as having that new car smell. I love hearing that. 
Having been with you for over eight years now, it felt like time to help out listeners and followers who need to know the basics of genealogical research, as well as how to understand your DNA test results and to be able to put them to work for you breaking down brick walls, identifying birth parents, locating new cousins who may have photos and information that can't be found anywhere else, and verifying your paper trails. Yes, DNA can do all that, and I can show you how. Check out the all-new ExtremeGenes.com website and download the free Genealogy Strategy Roadmap and the free DNA Starter Guide. Then, if you like what you see, you can take those next steps to sign up for the video courses that you can watch at your leisure. I'll take you through all the basics, step-by-step. Find out more now at ExtremeGenes.com. All right, back at it on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show at ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And it wasn't that long ago that I heard from one of our listeners about a book that she read that she thought maybe I should know about and talk to that author. And that author is with me on the phone right now. Her name is Jane Blasio, and she's written a book called Taken at Birth, which gives you a little idea where this is going. And Jane, welcome to Extreme Genes. Oh, thank you very much. I'm just uh, tickled to death to have you on. You know, ever since the, the DNA era has come to light, we have had so many different stories and each of them unique. And this seems to be even a little more unique. Let's go right to the beginning. All right. So in the 1940s, 50s and 60s, there was a doctor in North Georgia up in a small mountain town, McKaysville, Georgia, that was selling babies. From what the townsfolk had told me over the years, that there were always cars lined up there. He was a known abortionist, but he also did the adoptions. The thing that was probably the most heartbreaking part of the adoptions is that some of the women were local women, or they would come from Atlanta or Chattanooga to have their babies, thinking that they were going to go home with them, and the Mm -hmm. doctor would lie to them and tell them the babies had died. Sure. He would sell those babies to somebody else. So a very, very complicated character was Dr. Hicks, the man that was doing this, the man that sold me. Most people in the town didn't know everything he was doing, and so half of them thought he was this angel, while the other half knew what he was doing, and they thought of him as just this devil, basically. Yeah, and I'm just amazed that there are doctors out there like that. He's certainly not the only one. Um, There were many of them out there, and I just don't think they can get away with it anymore because of the tools that we have, (laughs) knowing that eventually they're going to get uncovered. So where did you grow up? And tell me about your family that raised you. So I grew up in Akron, Ohio. My adoptive parents could not have children. And so through a family friend, through another friend of a friend here in Akron, there was a connection to Dr. Hicks there in McKaysville. So they went down and got two babies. My sister Michelle was born four years before me. Basically, they just drove down, gave him cash or a check, and turned back around with a baby in their arms with a fake birth certificate. And and so, so over time, did you begin to notice that there were differences between you and your parents that you couldn't explain or your sister? What, what kind of brought about the initial suspicions you must have had at some point? Well, I was six years old when my parents called me in from outside from playing in the yard And my sister was sitting there and she was crying and she was four years older than me. So she understood a little bit more of what was going on. The kids on the playground had said the phrase black market baby. And so, you know, talked about how our parents paid cash for us. And basically friends of the family and some family members had been talking about it and their kids must have been listening. So with ears perked up, they heard that. And then, of course, they went ahead and and started using those terms with my sister and I on the playground. The playground is a cruel place, you know. (laughs) It is. So, yeah, so it went from there. So then six years old, my parents were forced to tell my sister and I that not only were we adopted, but they had to explain that, you know, maybe somewhere later in your life, we'll explain what black market means. But we learned that we were adopted that day. Yeah. From that time on. You know, there was always this, well, what was that? And I didn't fit in with them. They were redheads, fair skinned, and I was dark hair and light olive and green eyes versus their brown and their blue sure. eyes. And so I always felt like I just didn't belong. So, yeah, so that just started it. And, you know, I started asking questions. And then, of course, my parents didn't want to even tell us that we were adopted. So they really didn't want to tell us any details. And they really didn't want to tell us the details that they paid cash and that it was illegal. 
So they didn't say anything. And, you know, when a child's growing up and they ask questions and somebody doesn't answer them, well, that's just worse. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, wow. Yeah, you might as well tell them the truth because they're just sure. going to keep digging. Yeah, so. yeah. So did it impact your relationship with your parents during your teen years and early 20s? Uh, yeah, I didn't trust them. You start to question. It's like, well, if they lied about that, what else are they lying about? Sure, of course. And what about your relationship with your sister? You know, we always had each other's backs. She wasn't interested in finding her birth family like I was. For me, it was like a fire had been lit inside. It was constantly there in the background for me. Sure. So for how long then did you have to sit on this before the tools were available for you to find out where you came from? <laughs> well, I knew at 18 I could do what I wanted. So at 18, I started researching. And you got to remember, this was back in the early 80s before okay. DNA is what yep. it is today. Of course. There was no Ancestry.com. There was the Mormon Church, mm -hmm. which I could use, you know, their indexes. You know, I just started to do as much research as I could. And I detail in the book about what that process was for me. And it basically was that I uh, had found a private investigator in New York and had called him and said, can you help me find my birth family? I have a fake birth certificate. I have no paper trail. And he said, okay, it's going to be 500 bucks. Well, back in 1982, 83, <laughs> you know, I'm working at a dry cleaner, 500 bucks a day plus expenses. Oh, I wow. Said, there's no, there's no way. Sure. And he said, you know what, what have you done so far? And I told him, and he said, when you come up against a hurdle, you call me and I'll help you through. So I started doing what he said and it just rolled from there. He said, go and get your job with a private investigation firm and start honing your skills and just let me know if you need any help. That's awesome. Yes. So I did what he told me to do, and I consider myself to be fairly good at surveillance <laughs> and at workers' comp fraud <laughs> oh, um, <wow. laughs> and all of that that I learned in those early years with a private investigation firm. He definitely set for me not just the tone of an investigation, but he also set the tone of supporting and serving others doing the same thing. How cool um, is that, that a guy would yeah. uh, do that and take you under his wing? Did you wind up in that field? Well, I work in federal law enforcement. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. guess you do. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. So how did you connect with Dr. Hicks ultimately? Well, I had that birth certificate that said that I had been born at the Hicks Clinic and Thomas G. Garthy Hicks was the attending physician. So I had that information. And before today's technology and all the information systems that we have, the best place to start an investigation for an adoption search is usually it's in cemeteries Yeah, because you have date of birth, you have date of death, you have other family members. You may even find out exactly what they died from or you got military experience and what churches they may have gone to. So that's where you get your point of beginning. And so I found Dr. Hicks where he was buried because he was passed at that time okay. and just started searching it from there, just letting it spread out like wildfire. Was it publicly known at the time that he had been doing this at the point that he died? It wasn't publicly known. Like I said, half the town thought he was the saint, where the people that were the ambulance drivers, they were the furniture deliverers, the people in the banks, the people that worked, you know, doing insurance and stuff like that, that did intimate business with him. They knew what he was up to. Um, ah. The town officials, some of them knew because they themselves went to him to use his services when they got themselves into a bind with a woman. So some of them knew and some of them didn't, which made that hard because... The ones that didn't know put up a wall, and the ones that did know <laughs> wanted to be very, very careful what they said. Sure. Even though he was deceased, they still all knew who Dr. Hicks was. Right. So you're being stonewalled on both sides. Yeah, <laughs> essentially. Wow. For a while, so how old were you at this point? Now, how far along are we? <sighs> so I was in my very early 20s. That's great progress at that age. Unbelievable. Um, I don't like being told no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, people say, oh, you were so brave and oh, you were you were so fearless. And I'm like, no, I was just stupid. And don't tell me no, because I just <laughs> went, I, I'm going to find a workaround. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about now the next thing you want to find out who you came from, right? Oh, absolutely. Yes. And how long did it take? Did you have to wait for DNA to come along or were you able to do it sooner than that? Well, back in 1997, I had dug around and I got a lot of information about birth families, about the townsfolk, about Dr. Hicks and his family, just all these great colorful stories, but I hadn't received anything that was specific to a birth family. 
And in the process of finding all those stories and all that information, I also found out that he had sold roughly 200 babies to the Akron, Ohio area. So I sat down and I'm like, okay, what do I do? So I went to a local newspaper here, the Akron Beacon Journal, in 1997 to a columnist and said, can you help me? bring out people that were born at the Hicks Clinic, just nice. give them this information and, and have them get a hold of me. So I've been doing this on my own for 14 plus years. Right. If there's a group of us, we can storm someplace together instead of it just being <laughs> me. So I talked to the columnist and she said, yeah, okay. And she hung up the phone and <laughs> I didn't hear anything back. So I called back a week later and she picks up the phone i tell her again and she's like ah she asked me a few questions she says let me call you back so then a week later she calls me back and she says you know we fact checked what you said (laughs) and you were right i'm like yeah i've got like a whole lifetime of being right about this but they went ahead and they did a story which hit the ap wire in 97 so it became a bit of a media frenzy for about six to eight months so that brought out some of the other what we call hicks babies through that, I got a lot of leads on everything, and we set up what was in its infancy, the DNA registry with a DNA company. I don't want to give too much because it's all kind of outlined in the book. I don't want to give anything no, away. No, that's right. But I did find my information, and I found my birth family just recently, just really up in the last uh, about five years ago. That's unbelievable. Wow, what a story. And your determination is just absolutely astounding. She is Jane Blasio. She's written a book called Taken at Birth. Where can they get it, Jane? They can get it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, from the publisher, Baker Publishing House, basically any bookseller. Thanks for taking the time to come on and tell us about this. And congratulations, you did some incredible work. Well, thank you for having me. And if I can leave a few words, don't lose hope. Just keep digging. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Coming up next, we're going to talk to Sarah Gutman. She's a researcher with our sponsors over at Legacy Tree Genealogist. She's going to be talking about some brand new record sets that are coming out of Italy right now for those with Italian descent. You're going to love what she has to say when we return in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Welcome back, Genies. It is Fisher here. It's Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. And it has been quite a while since we had our good friend Sarah Gutman back on the show. She's with Legacy Tree Genealogist based out of Long Island, New York. Sarah, welcome back. It's great to have you. Thanks, Fisher. It's great to be back. You are always filled with all kinds of uh, interesting things, particularly relating to Italian genealogy research. And uh, these are things that I tend to say, who knew? There's so many things we're always learning from each other in this field. And uh, let's start with something you've learned here in the last little bit. Well, yeah, I'm like you said, I'm always learning new things, too. And it's always so exciting, especially when these new records pop up when you're doing a search and you say, oh, let me take a look at that, see what this is about. And one thing that's coming on the radar, some of these Italian records, the military records are starting to be available on Family Search and also the Italian archives Antonati. And what's really cool about this is just kind of like how in America, we have the World War One, World War II draft cards. Every male over the age of 21 was required to register for the draft. And they would fill out their card and have all that information about where they lived, what their parents' names were, what their occupation was. Wow. Really great stuff. Just kind of like how we have in America. Yeah, yeah but how far back are we talking here? Oh, right when... The kingdom of Italy became Italy as we know it. So we have about 1860s. So we can get really far back. Wow. Um, Yeah. And what's really interesting is when during this time period, a man under 18 was not allowed to leave Italy unless his entire family had also gone over to that other country. Ah, So he can't flee. He cannot escape the, uh, the military draft, right? Right. Only if your whole family goes over to America, then you can go. You can't just be, you know, the one that up and leaves and tries, like you said, try to run away. And another record collection that Italy has is once people were drafted, you were supposed to go and you were supposed to physically appear before the registry and present yourself. 
Right. And you could have another family member maybe do it if you were ill and you really had to kind of vouch for you to make sure that we're not available. And some of the reasons that people were given exemptions for was if you were a third or fourth son yeah. or later on and you had two other brothers who had served in the military, you could be exempt. You could be exempt also if you were the sole male of the household, whether you're the father wow. or if you're the only son and your father had passed or wasn't around, you could be exempt and that would all be written down. And something that I thought was really interesting was if you went to another country, say your whole family, like you did it legally, you went to America and your number, your name gets called. And if you're not there, you're considered pretty much a draft dodger. Huh. And if you were to come back to Italy, you could be imprisoned and you very well could be imprisoned. And your name was also written down that you did not show up and kept there. So that was another way of making sure that, you know, maybe you got a letter home in America and saying that, oh, your name was just called and you're supposed to go into the military. You know, you're not going to be coming back <laughs> pretty much for a very long time because if you come back, you're going to jail because you didn't wow. show up. I just can't imagine like that had to be very stressful for the people to decide, totally. oh, okay, I want to try out living in America. Like you're not coming back. So yeah, don't try it out. Yeah. You either do or you don't. <laughs> yeah. And then if you, if you do serve, they do have a record of course of your service and where you went and how long you were in and the ranks that you rose to. So you can find all that information as well, which is really cool. And wow. they have these records. So they're a little bit, different um, finding them. So in Italy, we have the provinces. So a province can have up to three military districts or a military district can cover two provinces. That's yeah. good. You know, uh, Holland is like this a lot. They've got fantastic military records and they go back even earlier than that. And they, they'll oh, often talk great. about who the parents were and what your occupation was. A lot of the same things you're talking about yeah. here. And before we came on, you were telling me that you found actually there's some new documents that are available that reveal three generations of a family in yes. one record. Tell me about this. Well, this is one of those really fun surprises. And with Legacy Tree, we work with a lot of really great on-site researchers who really are very familiar with the record set. And they come up with record collections that are not yet digitized and hopefully will come into our hands one day, but they're not there yet. But what Italy did, which is so cool, and I wish America had done this because this would have been amazing, is they have the family status certificates and what that is, is it's basically a three generation report. So imagine that you have to fill out the names, the birthplace, the ages of all your children. You have to tell yours and your spouse's information. And then you have to go back and you have to tell your parents and or even sometimes even go back as far as your grandparents Ooh. and put all their information down. So we have names, dates, places, occupations. The one that I got, which is such a wonderful surprise for the client, was 17 pages. So oh. imagine getting like a 17 page like census report just for your family. And it covered about three generations because it was the individual. And he went back and he did it all for his parents and his grandparents and his wife's family. And then he went and he did the descendants of each of them. So you get a really nice picture. And again, it's telling you the names, the ages, the occupations of please bull. And it also told some of them had immigrated to america and they wrote down the addresses of them in america like what a oh, amazing wow. thing that was yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully your your client then was able to maybe even contact some descendants and share that yeah. that's amazing it, so they started this in 1820 and it's still something that they still do to present day and they have about a 95 to 100 percent return rate basically so there's a very good chance that your family has one of these and as of right now, they can be found in the state archives, but also if you're able to maybe get an on-site researcher, they can usually be found in the village of where your family's from. Really, really cool finds. And then you also mentioned passports. Yes. And are these online now? Some of them are starting to be online. This was actually brought to my attention in one of the classes that I was teaching. A person had come up to me and they showed me the passport. So Right at the same time that they're instilling these military drafts, they wanted to make sure that the men were not leaving. Okay. So Italy. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're that really makes smart. sense. Don't go away. Yes. So in 1869, they started issuing passports to all the men. 
And again, it's going to be telling us the names of the individuals. They'll give you the address. They want to hunt them down. Sometimes they give the names of the parents. And all men were required to have these passports. Now, the catch is America did not require the individuals when they were coming over here to show their passports. So they still, you know, they had the passports, but they could still leave. But a lot of these local villages have kept those records. And some of them are starting to be able to come online. So this is another great find. And I wonder when they started or if they started showing the pictures of the people. So yeah. that could be really cool if you find something. Yeah, that's fun. I think we started in, in the United States somewhere in the 19 teens, the early teens. You know, the thing about this, too, is even if you don't have ancestors in Italy, it really goes to illustrate how many records are still out there, how many records you probably don't even know about from those countries, how many yeah. records are getting digitized, and how much we can anticipate coming online in, in the future, and probably not the too distant future. This is really exciting stuff. Yeah, you can access this on Family Search, and this is for Italy, and, and you can do this with other countries too. Type in Italy, and then type in the location of where your family's from. Go from bigger to smaller, and just see what record collections are available. Yeah. Well, Sarah Gutman, great to talk to you again, and uh, yeah, thanks for sharing can. this. This is always great stuff, and for people with Italian ancestry, I think there's some good stuff for people to start digging into and, and see what they can come up with. There's some yes. really great records now available all over the place. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. And coming up next, David Allen Lambert with another round of Ask Us Anything when we return on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Hey, Genies. Ancestry now has an exclusive partnership with PhotoMine, the leader in photo scanning and archiving. What does this mean to you? Well, imagine inheriting an old photo album and you want to digitize all the images. Up until now, you'd have to remove the pictures, place them in a scanner, crop them, and perhaps use Photoshop to improve them. Now, by using these amazing PhotoMine tools from Ancestry, you can use your phone to take a picture of an entire page from your album. The tools will automatically separate and crop each picture, improve focus, and restore color or colorize your images. Then you can assign which picture goes to which person on your tree. If you've been waiting years to get around to the tedious project of scanning your old albums, it's been worth the wait. No more pulling your photo albums apart and trying to reinsert the pictures back in proper order. No more tearing of your old photos while removing them from those so-called magnetic albums of the 1970s. Sign in to Ancestry through their mobile app to try it out. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogist. Legacy Tree Genealogist has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogists calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Hey, Genies. As we've dug into our family history explorations over the past year, our community at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies has taken off. This is where you can meet like-minded genealogists who can help you break through those brick walls and find a whole city behind it occupied by ancestors whose names you don't even know yet. This is where you can learn from your fellow Genies and ask questions because many in our community have already been into some of the records you're looking for. Genealogy and and Breakthrough Strategies is free. What a great place for brainstorming and getting to know other people who totally get your passion for family history research. If you're looking to take the next step in sharpening your skills, here's a great chance to learn from others and give back in areas you've already become expert in. So join us. That page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. It's a long name, but we cover a lot of territory. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies.
All right, back on the job. It's Fish and Dave, and it is Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. And, David, our first question today comes from Loreen in New Hampshire. And she says, guys, hope you had a great summer. Recently, I started researching some 17th century ancestors and found out online that they were part of the founding of my hometown. What a surprise. Any thoughts on how I can find out more about what they did? Good question, Lorene. That That's actually kind of fun, isn't it, Dave? And I've had that happen myself. How about you? Oh, absolutely. In fact, more so for my wife, we live about a half a mile from where her ancestors lived in the early 18th century. And the family has gone full circle since the 1760s when they left. Well, one thought I have is I just got back from a trip to my hometown in Connecticut. And I went to my elementary school just on the other side of the Mianus River in a section of town called Riverside. And there was a little bridge that went over there. And I had no idea growing up, riding my bike there to play baseball. Every time I'd go over that bridge, I'd go fishing off that bridge. Never knew that the original bridge there was built in 1687 by some of my relatives. It was a couple of uncles, you know, my great, 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 great great uncles, something like that from the Lockwood family, which was a big surprise to me. And then I started looking online and digging a little more and found out it was part of the old King's Highway that went up to Boston. Later, the Boston Post Road took the place of that. George Washington had gone over this bridge on his way to Boston at the beginning of the revolution. And then they replaced that bridge in 1907. But I found a picture online of this bridge before the replacement that I knew all my life that was built in 1907. So it's amazing the things you can discover, but I would say the best thing you can do is find out who's in charge of the historical society for your town or for your county because they're Mm going to have things there that you can't possibly find online. The small town, small county places do not digitize a lot of material. Right. I mean, if you're trying to find out what they did, one of the greatest resources are deeds, as they often say, I, David Lambert, comma, a genealogist, purchase of, I mean, so it gives you occupation right there. Right. So that's usually good from the 17th century, 18th century as well. Have you found, Dave, that when you find something about one of your ancestors in one of those old histories, either of the town or of the county, that there's a lot of errors in there? Mm -hmm. historical interpretation with no footnotes right all through 19th century and early 20th century histories because a lot of it's speculation or old yarns that people have spun for years about this family or that yeah and and this was the thing with this bridge i was finding out they said it was these two brothers and they named them and i started going through the records and i couldn't find those two brothers among any of the early families and now that didn't make any sense i think i know who the other brother was but you know this is the point loreen as to why you want to work with the original records like david is talking about some of the land records obviously histories are terrific if they have provided you with the sources from which they wrote what they wrote but Mm -hmm. you can find a lot of the stories and the myths and all those things and those can be uh, very helpful Primary source, primary source, and await primary source. Yeah, always. (laughs) The other thing that's fun about uh, going to some of these historical societies for counties and towns and cities is they often have photographs that you can't find anywhere else. And Mm -hmm. and historical societies are dotted with them. Just loaded with them. And sometimes you can find pictures of places that you're very familiar with, what they looked like 100 years ago, sometimes 150 years ago. I've actually even also found maps of my hometown from 1867 that showed the names of the people who lived there at the time and where they lived. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can find out there that you would have never thought about otherwise. So thanks for the question, Lorene. We have another one coming up next when we return on Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
All right, back at it on Ask Us Anything on Extreme Genes. It is Fisher and Dave here. And Dave, this is in some ways kind of similar to our last question. I think a lot of people are thinking about these things from uh, summer travel. This comes from Leon, and he says, Dave and Fish, guys, I am not a genealogist, but I'm told that genealogical skills could help me research the home I now live in, which is said to date back to the 1770s here in Pennsylvania. Could you tell me where to start, Leon? Good question. Well, I mean, obviously, the first document you have is the one that allows you to own your home, your deed. Yep. You just do a reverse deed search. Title examiners do this all the time to show clear title. But this case, you want to find out how far back you can take the property. now. And also keep in mind, your property now might be on a few acres could have been on a few hundred acres in the 1770s. Mm -hmm. So don't be surprised if you see a lot of doddering off of different parcels of property. But deeds are definitely the first place I would look. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I did this recently also. I found that the online records only went back to the 1930s. And if I really wanted to dig into it, I would have to go back into some of the original records, many of which are on microfilm, I guess. But there are a lot of places that have not digitized these things, but a lot of places that have. And the other thing that you have, once you have the deeds... You already have the owners, yep. and conveniently for a house built in the 1770s, we have federal censuses in 1790. Every 10 years, with the exception of the burnt census of 1890, you're going to find the family. And then by 1850, you can find out the kids that live there, other family members. You may even find there's enslaved people who lived on the property at one point in time, so don't be surprised you'd see that. Find out where the local cemetery is. I bet you a lot of the early families that lived there were buried nearby or, hey, they could even be on your property. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Well, that is the challenge, isn't it? As you go back, you kind of have to figure out how pulling forward the property was divided up because there are not a lot of people with 100 acre parcels of land still out there. Right. The other thing is a local historical society. Mm -hmm. Definitely go there. They could have old maps. They could have photographs. They could even have diaries of the people that live there. How amazing would that be to read a diary that took place in the house that you're actually living in now? Going day by day and seeing what was going on. So it is very possible to do that. And then crowdsourcing. Create a little web page about your house. I promise you, some genealogist with ties (laughs) to those families will come forward and you may find more photos or letters or artifacts. How neat would it be to have something that was in the house and say 1910 that somebody still has yeah. in their home that they say, oh, here, I got a whole bunch of these dishes. You can have one of them back. And people do that kind of thing. Absolutely. I wish I could track down some of the things that were originally in my house, but heck, after we've lived here since 1965, I got enough stuff in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Don't need any more. No, but you're going to have a lot of fun. And as you learn more about the people who lived in your house, it may even give you an inkling to want to research your own family or where you lived before and where your ancestors lived. So I think you've opened Pandora's box. (laughs) Your house history is going to also want you to do your own history. Yeah, isn't that funny how that works? You may not be a genealogist now, but you're going to be really soon. (laughs) Just wait. (laughs) All right. Thanks so much for the question, Leon. And best of luck in that search. That is a lot of fun. You're going to enjoy the journey. And David, as always, thanks so much for your expertise on Ask Us Anything and on the show. And we will talk to you again next week. All right. Until then, my friend. All right, buddy. And thanks once again to author Jane Blasio, the author of the book Taken at Birth, talking about her crazy experience that really took her life in a whole new direction. If you missed any of the interview with her, you can, of course, catch the podcast on Apple Media, iHeartRadio, ExtremeGenes.com, or Spotify. We're all over the place. Also, Sarah Gutman, of course, from our sponsors over at Legacy Tree Genealogists, talking about some new great databases out of Italy. Thanks to them all, and thanks to you for joining us. It's great to be back. We'll talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're in nice, normal family.